in lab, experiment 10 and 11 is what you have on your syllabus. Um, we'll be talking about both of these experiments, but the doing in lab is experiment 11. So you'll be taking your alcohol that you made last week, and you'll be doing a dehydration reaction with it, an elimination reaction with it to make um, a series of alkenes, okay? Um, so the pre-lab portion is pre-lab experiment 11 but it needs to be specific to the alcohol that you made for experiment eight. Um, we'll have a quiz this week, so make sure you're ready for that. Always bring a calculator for that. Um, experiment <coughs> seven report is due this week. We're taking your notebooks from you, and remember that report is 75 points, so do, do a really good job with that report. Next week, we'll be doing experiment 12 and 13, so this is another one where we've got the experiment and then talking about the technique you're going to use. The pre-labbing will be for experiment 12, and then we'll also talk about how experiment 13 is related. In two weeks, experiment 8 and 11 reports are due, so there's one report for both experiments because they're related to each other. That is also 75 points. In your notebook, though, keep a separate pre-lab and experimental for experiment 8 and 11, okay? So keep the pre-lab <coughs> separate, the experimental pages separate. You'll be writing a common conclusion, so we'll, we'll talk more about that when we, we get to that point. Um, registration this week for um, spring semester. Um, let me take myself <coughs> out of here. So, um, what are the differences between 256A and 256B? So 256A um, is a similar type of uh, lab as what you have been taking. Things, experiments will come from the lab manual. Um, if, you're, if you at all need to take the second semester lab, you need to take experiment 256A. And you need to take 256A before you can take 256D, okay? Um, and you wanna take those in the same semester with the same instructor, all right? 256B is the independent project, so that is optional. Um, you will uh, propose a three-step synthesis and then do literature searching for that synthesis and then attempt the synthesis um, over the second half of next semester. Um, so depending on what you need as far as credits and what you're trying to do, whether you're a chemistry major or health professions interested in um, organic chemistry but a lot of other things as well um, those are kind of the differences I I recommend doing 256b if at all possible in your schedule most students um, that partake in the independent project actually learn a great deal um, from the independent project and have a good time completing the ind independent project um, if you have any interest at all in doing research, but maybe haven't connected with a group yet, or um, aren't sure if it's quite for you, but you want to try it out, 56 <coughs> b is an excellent way to do that, um, with basically a seven-week commitment versus like committing an entire semester to research or something like that. So I do recommend, if you're at all interested, um, to try 56 b out as well. There are... Um, Five sections of things. So sections <coughs> one through four, you can take the A component and the B component um, because that instructor will be teaching both of them. For section 5A, um, that section is only for the A component, and so there's not a B offered for section 5A, okay? So if you know for sure you're not interested in the B, um, in doing the B portion, register for 5A if you can on, on Thursday morning, if Thursday morning was one of your options. Um, any of the other sections, if you're only interested in A, that's, that's available for all of the sections, but if you're interested in B, you want to register for an A section where there's also a corresponding B section, okay? Um, if you have questions, I can answer them up here after class, but as far as registration, I'm gonna defer like questions with reg registration or issues with not getting into classes, things like that, to Dr. Jeff Johnson, because I'm on sabbatical next semester, so I'm not involved, <laughs> okay? So, I'm out of it. Um, but, big thing is, as far as registration, you will get into a lab section, okay? So don't ever question that. 
you will get into a lab section. Sometimes it takes creative moves, but it happens, okay? So don't question that. Um, the best thing to do is if you go to register and what you need, now keep in, in mind needs versus wants, what you need to make your schedule work for next semester is not available. Get on the wait list, wait list for that section, okay? As the best thing you can do is make sure you're on the wait list because during registration, nothing can happen during the wait list period with getting <coughs> you into that section if you're not on a wait list. If you're not on a wait list, you have to wait till drop ad starts to then be added to a section, okay? So get on the wait list if you can't register for what you need. Um, and then, like I said, if you have questions beyond that, see, see doc, Dr. Johnson as far as that, okay? But if you have questions ask, after today, let me know, or at the end of today, I can answer those questions too. Um, another announcement, we've had a few um, incidents with pipettes lately in the lab, so we need to be careful with our glassware and not nick ourselves with our glassware. So be careful handling pipettes. If they're chipped at all, get rid of them in the glass waste and start with new pipettes, okay? Be careful when you're putting the pipette bulbs on them not to get them into your fingers and so on and so forth, okay? Um, also, just in general, be careful with glass. I mean, if pipettes are a problem, general glassware is going to be a problem, okay? So just be careful handling glassware. If you feel like anything's chipped, nicked, something like that, there's a potential that you could get cut on it. Let us know, um, and we'll try try and get you a replacement. Okay. All right. <coughs> now here we go. So, a couple things for we got to finish up a couple things with experiment eight before we can start looking at experiment ten and eleven. Um, when you come to lab this week. You need to have completed all the way through the simple distillation of your ether from last week. So you need to make sure that is done before you come to lab this week. If you are doing that in an open lab time, make sure you let your lab prof know when you're in lab. And also make sure you have a buddy to help you out and make sure that you're, you're safe while you are in lab. Okay. So what you should be starting with in lab this week, if you didn't complete it last week, is you'll need to do the fractional distillation to purify your alcohol. And so it's really important you know the boiling point of your alcohol. And with all of the combinations of things that people could have made last week, there's actually only four alcohols that were made. Okay, So there's three heptanol, four heptanol, three octanol, and four octanol, okay? So heptanol is boiling point. So here, know the boiling point. I'm giving it to you right now. 156 for um, three and four. And for three octanol um, and four octanol, we've got a range and so just a boiling point. <coughs> One, mid 170s for the alcohols. <laughs> With these distillations, what you want to do is start collecting about 20 degrees below the boiling point, okay? Um, and then you could collect multiple fractions of the, the product. We'll probably use all the fractions that we call <coughs> product in experiment 11. But if you want to, when you get up to the boiling point of of your alcohol, if you want to collect a more pure fraction for GC and IR, that is fine. So you could collect alcohol from 20 degrees below the boiling point up to the boiling point, and then try and collect more pure alcohol. Um, and then you really shouldn't be eclipsing the boiling point. The one thing you should be looking out for, though, is make sure you don't boil it to dryness. So make sure you're leaving a little bit of liquid in that distillation apparatus or everything's going to get charred and you could potentially start a fire. Okay. Um, we will probably use the 20 plus or the minus 20 um, boiling point range of that alcohol in experiment 11 as well as your really pure stuff, but your pure stuff will help with um, getting a good clean GC and IR for your analysis, okay? So after you've done the fractional distillation, you need to prepare experiment 8 GC sample. Actually, even before that, as always, you want yield. 
okay? Anything we make, we always want to yield. Then prepare the experiment on the HGC sample, and then set aside a little bit for IR. And so in a vial, I mean, it's they're all liquids, so you know you need one drop to collect an IR spectrum. So set aside just a little bit for for the IR spectrum, okay? And then keep going on with experiment um, 11, okay? So I wouldn't stop here to collect the IR spectrum because that can happen in open lab or at the end of the lab period. Make the GC sample, set aside the, the little bit for IR, and then get moving with experiment um, 11, all right? So for experiment 11, so this should be very timely with your exam on Friday and all of the substitution uh, mechanisms and then elimination mechanisms, we're going to be doing an elimination reaction. <coughs> and um, what we're looking, so remember experiment seven, we had an E2 mechanism, this time we're gonna have an E1 mechanism, okay? And so, E1 elimination, and it should be, so kind of double check for things for Friday's exam, make sure that as I go through this that it is really apparent why this is an E1 mechanism. So I'm going to just start with an example alcohol of what we're looking at here, um, and so I've got a 2-heptanol, okay, and Um, did they count that? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. For some reason, it just looks extra long to me. Okay, so here's our two heptanol. We are going to be doing this reaction in very um, concentrated acid, so not 18 molar, but it's only half dilute, so the 9 molar sulfuric acid that you guys used last week. Um, we're going to, without diluting it this time, that's what you're going to use for basically your reaction mixture. So your alcohol and 50 milliliters of 9 molar sulfuric acid are going to get all mixed together, heated together. Um, and so hence, it's going to be really easy to come up with our acid for, for um, this mechanism. But our OH group, our alcohol group, can take a proton from all of the acid that's floating around in there. And so then we'll make a really nice leaving group for our reaction. <coughs> we'll have our water here, which is um, really happy to leave. And because of all this acid, we're, we can make a you know, a par positively charged species is something that can happen. Um, in this situation, okay? Because it is very acidic. We still will have um, the conjugate base of any acid that reacts, and so it can help finish out this mechanism so that we can um, form our double bond and get rid of our carbocation. So we've got proton here, carbocation, and that carbon, We've got all these <coughs> wonderful protons hanging off this methyl group, as well as we've got protons here, okay? And so our conjugate base could basically come in and take from this side or take a proton from this side. Um, but either way, once it takes the proton, then we'll have electrons help make our alkene, okay? So we could either, from this situation, we'd make one heptene, so proton from the methyl group um, was taken, then we'd have the one heptene, or we could have cis and trans two heptene. the protons come from the other side. Okay. Um, so 
either of these um, products would be a possibility for your reaction mixture. Now, one thing that we, we've got an E1 mechanism, so that means we are like we're forming an intermediate. It doesn't happen all in one step directly from starting materials to products. So we've got this carbocation that forms um, <coughs> that before it goes down to the products can rearrange. And so um, we could get a hydride shifts to get this carbocation rearrangement. Now the thing to remember, so if we, we're looking at our carbocation, would it want to rearrange this direction to this terminal carbon, or would it want to rearrange further into the chain? Towards the middle. Towards the middle, right? And so remember, it's a hydride shift that makes that happen. And you will always rearrange to something equally stable or more stable than the carbocation that was formed. Okay, So if it goes out here to this terminal primary carbon, it's going to be less stable than being able to form on any of these other carbons, being that it would be a secondary carbocation just like what we've got here. So we can get... guy that still has a methyl group intact, but then <coughs> the arrangement, something like this. Okay. So keep in mind what you know about carbocations and their stability. Um, you know, secondary are going to be more stable than primary, and tertiary are going to be more stable than primary or secondary. Okay. Um, now, the other thing that we have to consider when we're looking at the formation of double bonds, is Zaitsev's rule, okay? Now, what does Zaitsev's rule say? Does it say anything about the carbocation? <coughs> no, right? Remember, it's talking about the final product when you're looking at Zaitsev's rule. So what does Zaitsev's rule say? The more stable alkene will be favored, okay? So we're talking about the final product, more stable alkene will be favored. And when we're looking at more stable, in this comparison here, what, we can, what would we say as being more stable or less stable and why? The cis and trans would be more stable, why? More the more substitute the alkene, the more the more stable it's going to be. Okay, so the more um, stable alkene will be formed, which means <coughs> the more substituted alkene is there. So just remember, when you're referring to this, we're talking about the final product, what we're looking at, okay? Now the other thing to consider is we've got cis and trans. When we're looking at cis versus trans alkenes, who's going to be favored? Trans. Trans will be more favored, right? Now that doesn't mean you won't see cis, okay? So that doesn't mean 100% of your product's gonna be all trans alkenes. It just means more of your product will probably be trans than it will be cis, okay? Now, if you have um, <coughs> trans product, you probably will have <coughs> cis product, okay? So it just won't fall away to the wayside, okay? So keep that in mind when you're looking at your GC analysis, because some of the decisions you're gonna have to make um, have to do with cis versus trans. You won't just see only trans and see, see um, no cis that appears, okay, or is formed. Um, same with, if you had a possibility like this where you had one heptene versus a two heptene, this is gonna be the more favored compound, but that doesn't mean you won't see one heptene, okay? So keep, keep all these in mind. Things are more favored versus less favored, but not absolute 100% product. The other thing we've got is this reaction is occurring at equilibrium. So 
keep that in mind as far as um, when you're talking about the reaction, it is at equilibrium and we're trying to push it and drive it um, to final product. And then what we regenerate in the end is it's acid catalyzed, okay? So we regenerate the acid as we go, go through the rea reaction cycle, all right? <coughs> Now, we use H2SO4 versus HCl. So we could do this reaction with the same concentration of HCl. That, that would be just as easy as doing it with H2SO4. But why do we use sulfuric acid versus hydrochloric acid? Non-nucleophilic. Right. The conjugate base, so both of these as acids would have equal power in the reaction. The conjugate base, so the SO4 minus, HSO4 minus versus chloride ion, this is going to have less power as a nucleophile than the chloride ion. So if we use HCl, instead of getting all elimination, we potentially could get substitution product and elimination product versus using HSO4 minus, we're going to get, we want to go hopefully majority to elimination product and not see <coughs> substitution product, okay? Because this is not a good nucleophile, this is. <coughs> Everyone see that? Okay. So the choice of acid is really important to get the reaction to go the way we want it to. Now, we've got our nine molar sulfuric acid. Be really careful with it. Um, getting your reaction set up, so on and so forth. <coughs> also, we're boiling this, okay? So last week we were just doing a workup with the nine molar sulfuric acid. We had to be careful handling it. This time, we're going to be boiling this reaction. And we need to be careful because all the glassware is going to be coated with acid all the way through the distillation apparatus that you're going to be setting up, okay? So be careful with handling it, getting the reaction set up, but also be careful when you go to take things apart. A little bit here, I'll talk about um, the waste disposal as well, okay? But wear gloves um, this week. Um, the alcohols and alkenes can kind of be irritating, but the sulfuric acid is, is the big um, concern we want to be careful with not to get on ourselves, all right? Um, now, with the steam distillation, You're basically co-distilling our product and the um, acidic water that is coming over, okay? So you're going to have alkene product and also our aqueous sulfuric acid coming over, coming over at the same time in the distillation. You're, you're setting up, it's a simple distillation. <coughs> and you're going to collect in your 25 milliliter graduated cylinder. So we've got, in the labs, we have the apparatus set up. Basically, it's the same simple distillation you've been setting up multiple times now. It's just we're collecting our product in the 25 milliliter grad cylinder. As it's distilling, you've got this combination coming over. Looks like it's all one thing, but then as it comes over and cools down, it's going to separate out into two layers. The boiling point is going to be lower than, than your two um, substituents, okay? So lower than because it's coming over as a mixture. So our nine molar sulfuric acid's boiling point is about 110 degrees or so. You're going to be boiling over lower than that. So usually it's um, 80s to 90s, near 100, but you don't really go, go over 100 degrees, okay? And it, it's not like you'll have you know, a little bit of something come over, and then you'll worry about collecting 
um, the mixture coming over. It's all going to come, what's going to distill over is going to distill over as a mixture, okay? So the thing to be careful with with the boiling point is you don't want to say the boiling point of the alkene was this, okay? Because the boiling point that you're measuring is the measurement of a mixture, not of any one pure substance, okay? So record the boiling point, be, be careful when you quote it. It's not, it's not um, exactly a pure substance that's coming over, it's coming over as a mixture. The other thing is we're not going to distill all 50 milliliters of sulfuric acid over. The distillation ends when the alkene is done distilling over. So, like I said, in your graduated cylinder, things are going to separate out. You're going to have an organic layer and you're going to have an aqueous layer. Now, who's on top? Organic layer. Your alkene is less dense than the sulfuric acid water layer that's going to be on the bottom, okay? So when the top layer stops growing, so you're, you're distilling over in a graduated cylinder so you can measure volume, okay? When the top layer stops distilling over, then you're done with the distillation. So when that top layer isn't growing anymore, so say you collect <coughs> five mils, and then you keep watching and watching and watching, and the top layer is still five mils, the bottom layer keeps growing, you're done. Once you've stopped adding to that top layer, <coughs> right? Now I wouldn't, you know, make that decision like one minute it's coming over, the next minute I'm done. Maybe wait a couple minutes to verify that the top layer isn't growing <coughs> anymore. But once it is done, um, adding to that top <coughs> layer, you're done with the distillation. Okay. Now, once you're done with the distillation, just turn it off, let it cool down very slowly. Um, like I said, everything's co coated with acid, okay? So we're gonna have to rinse everything out with water because everything, all that glassware is coated with acid. So let things cool down slowly. Put your graduated cylinder in a safe spot, okay? You're, you're collecting two to maybe six milliliters of alkene, not a lot, all right? And remember what you had to do to get there. You'd have to, to reproduce, you'd have to go all the way through the Grignard reaction again and experiment 11 in order to get back there again, which no one really wants to do that. So be careful with your alkene. Don't take the bottom off of the graduated cylinder. Leave the bottom on in the distillation apparatus because that's usually a fatal flaw. People will take that off of the distillation apparatus, not put the bottom back on, and there goes the graduated cylinder, and then that's when we do Kim wipe um, extractions from the from the hood, okay? So you don't want to do that. So be careful with your alkene, put it in a safe spot, start taking the apparatus apart once it's cool. push the distillation to where there's no more alkene coming over, there really shouldn't be a whole lot of our organic left in your distillation part. So our distillation part, <coughs> where should this waste go? Down the sink, right? Do not, you never want to put acid in an organic waste container because it's very reactive and you don't want it reacting with the waste that's in the waste container. So this does not go in the organic waste. Down sink. Actually, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Okay, you're going to pour the distillation pot.
into like, you know, three to four hundred milliliters of water. So use, use your bigger beaker, then pour all of that down the sink with lots of water in your hose. Make sure that you are putting it, we don't want to also have people breathing acid vapor. So it has to go down the sink in the hood, lots of water, run water, flush it down the sink, okay? Um, then with your alkene, be careful with the workup. So you're going to have to wash it with um, sodium bicarbonate, but remember you only have a couple mil milliliters. You're still going to be using your separatory funnel but be careful with it so it doesn't disappear on you, okay? Um, and then after you, <coughs> you are done with the workup, we're not adding any solvent to it, we're leaving the alkene as the neat alkene. So don't, um, don't try and add ether to it or anything like that. You're going to go through the washes that you need to and the separations that you need to. So first you'll separate your organic layer, then wash with sodium bicarbonate, and then you need to dry it with mag sulfate, but be careful. Use only what you need. So you only need enough to have, little, have clumps. <coughs> um, clumps with a little bit of free floating <coughs> in a very small volume. We don't want to have to rinse um, this alkene away from the magnesium sulfate. We need to be able to filter it away from the magnesium sulfate. So make sure that you only use what you need of magnesium sulfate. And then what I would do is filter it filter it into a tear vial so that you can easily <coughs> get the um, yield without then having to transfer it again. Now to filter it, we're going to use something we haven't used before. We're going to use um, an apparatus from experiment nine. That's why experiment nine is in your lab manual, is for this part here. Basically you're going to take a pipette and put a tiny little bit of um, chem wipe in it. So take a new clean pipette, tiny little bit of chem wipe, and then you're going to pipette over your mixture with your alkenes and your magnesium sulfate in through the pipette. Let it drain out the pipette into the vial. And um, then once it is drained all the way out, that, that is your alkene, okay? So this is our gravity filtration apparatus for tiny little, little amounts, all right? Um, these pipettes then need to be, once you're done getting your alkene out, Rinse them with acetone into the organic waste, and then there's a beaker in the reagent hoods to collect these pipettes. So once you've turned your um, pipette into a filtering pipette, you're not getting your pipette back again, so don't try and salvage it, okay? We're just going to dispose of them. Rinse them out with acetone into the organic waste, and then put them in the um, container in the reagent hood. If you don't rinse them out, the alkenes have quite a cinch. The whole lab's going to start smelling like <coughs> all sorts of different alkenes. Okay, so rinse it out before you take it out of your out of your hood. <coughs> then you have your alkene. Okay, you get the yield. Um, so for our alkene. Alkenes, it's going to be a mixture. Alkenes, we're going to need our yield. You're going to need to prepare a GC sample. And I'll talk about that here in a second. And then you need to collect the IR spectrum. So same things for experiment eight is what you need for um, experiment 11's product. With the GC sample, 
The instructions um, for preparing a GC sample are on page 1014 of your lab manual. Okay. But if you have a nice clean alkene, okay, no, no signs of water, because that will kill our GC column, and no solids, because that will kill the GC column, you may take one drop of your alkene put it in a GC vial and fill it to the neck um, with pentane and cap it. So if you have a very clean sample, you may do that. If you're at all questionable, follow these, um, these instructions and then have your um, lab prof check it before you submit your GC sample. With the GC samples, the vials have this white box on them. So we'll show you in lab the GC um, <coughs> vials. In there, you want to label it with notebook, or sorry, initials and notebook page. than experiment 11, so there should be different notebook pages for each of your samples. So experiment 8 and experiment 11, you want to label them the same way on the vial. <coughs> and you also, there's a sheet you will fill out where you'll put your name and sample ID for experiment 8 and a sample ID for experiment 11. These are your sample IDs. Make sure it is very clear what you want um, it labeled it as, otherwise when you go to get your data, it may be hard to figure out whose data is whose, okay? So initials, notebook page, nothing else as far as labeling. Um, make sure it's both on the vial and on the sheet that's <coughs> filled out. The sheet that's filled out is what we type into the computer. So make sure it's very clear, but we also check vial versus the sheet to make sure everything corresponds, all right? So before you leave, <coughs> Make sure you submit two GC samples. Because we will be running them over the course of the week. Um, the other thing is they have caps on them with um, septum. Just make sure you don't tighten the caps too much. Tighten them so they're closed, but if you really crank on tightening the cap, it makes a dimple in it and makes the auto sample on the GC not so happy. Okay, so make sure before you leave, we've got your GC samples, because we'll, we'll have to run them over the week. So now, as far as GC, let's actually talk about what GC is. So GC is another form of chromatography. So we've talked about um, <coughs> gel permeation chromatography. Now we're going to talk about gas chromatography. And that's what's covered in experiment 10. We talked about with chromatography, what do you always have? What are the two things you always have with chromatography? Stationary phase and a mobile phase. Okay, so the stationary phase is in this column. We call it a capillary column. It's very tiny. We'll show you this this week um, in lab. The stationary phase is this polymer coating of this very inside this very tiny column. So it's actually even even smaller column than we would have used for gel permeation chromatography. So that stationary phase, it's the polymer coating inside the um, column. It's, um, very, it's not heat sensitive and it's not um, chemically, like it won't deteriorate really easily chemically. Okay, so it's a very stable polymer coating. 
both thermally and chemically. And then our mobile phase, based on what this is called, what do you think is going to move, move everything through? It's going to be the gases, right? Yeah, hence gas chromatography. So the mole phase is the gases, the carrier gases that are pushing everything through the system. Um, now, the stationary phase that we use, the column that we use, is relatively <coughs> nonpolar. And so what that means is a separation <coughs> of compounds is mainly based <coughs> on the boiling point of those compounds. Okay? And you the retain the way it um, comes through the column is low boiling point comes through first and then high boiling comes points, um, compounds with high boiling po points come afterwards, okay? So low BP compounds pollute first, followed by higher boiling point compounds. And when we talk about boiling points, it just this technique, we are able to separate things that differ within only a couple degrees. Because our alkene mixture, we're going to be able to separate out our, your alkene mixture. Those alkenes are not going to differ very much um, by boiling point, a couple degrees. Okay, And so it's a really powerful tool because of that type of separation. So this is, this like not as pretty, but a little bit prettier in your lab manual. This is a picture of one of the GC instruments. But this is kind of the general scheme of what happens. The sample is injected in the injector. It runs through the column where things are separated out, comes out the detector, and that data is given to the data system, and then you get, get a print out from there. Okay? So I'm going to go through kind of quickly here those, those pieces. All right. So first of all, the inside of this capillary column, and the capillary column is like little bit bigger than the size of a hair. It's a really, really tiny, tiny column. So this is much amplified, but basically within that column, there's polymer coating on each side of it, and what we are trying to separate, the sample that's trying to be separated goes through the center of it. So with this column, um, first of all, when we put the sample into the injector, the injector's job is to vaporize the sample. So it turns it, it's very hot, 250 degrees Celsius, turns everything into a vapor, okay? Then it goes to the column where things are much more cool than 250 degrees. And this vapor then gets separated out by boiling point because we, we then start heating up the column. And as it is heated up, um, components start vaporizing and coming <coughs> off the column. And so then, once they're separated, um, then we can um, determine what the, c the components are using standards and we can um, calculate how much of each component there is. So here's kind of schematic of the injector. We have an auto sampler that's on top of this, so you'll see that in lab this week. But when the auto sampler injects into the septum, this is all really hot, so you wouldn't want to touch it. But we've got carrier gas, which we've got a mixture of um, helium and oxygen that's going into the injector, and then we inject the sample, one microliter, very tiny amount. It's turned into um, a vapor, and then leads, this is all pushed into the capillary column. And so then that column is really long. It's um, usually a standard size is about 30 meters for the column, so it's all coiled together. Um, so there, you know, we don't have a 30 meter long instrument. It's just tightly coiled together into a box. Um, but it's got to run the whole length of that column. And so here in your lab manual are some of some of the um, 
types of columns um, or in stationary phases that are on the columns, the stationary liquid polymer phase on the column. Um, and this is, this structure is um, this guy right here, our HP5, DB5, OB5, which is similar to what we've got on the GC. So it's very relatively non-polar. We've got a lot of um, carbon um, silica bonds with some aromatic rings in there and some oxygens in there, but it's really not a very polar compound at all. So it's not really going <coughs> to hold on to compounds based on polarity, which we'll, t we'll talk about a different technique next week where we use polarity. But once it's run through the column, we have to figure out how much we have. And so it goes through a flame ionization detector, an FID. <coughs> and what happens is we've got our sample, so our sample's coming in from the bottom here, okay? Sample is coming in um, as it comes off the column, so it's now separated into um, unique compounds coming off the column. Um, being carried in the carrier gas goes through the sample inlet and then it's mixed um, with hydrogen and basically is charred in this hydrogen flame but it's got there's electrostatic potential within um, the uh, detector and so what comes out of that flame is free electrons and then ionically um, charged species ionic fragments okay and so those ionic fragments are detected at an electrode, so it makes electric current based on those ionic fragments. And how much um, sample is there and how much potential it can create are related to each other. So it's actually a really, um, it's a, a really sensitive type of detector to use on a GC because that um, ionizing of the sample and then collecting on an electrode um, is a really sensitive method for determining how much is in that sample. So it will tell you peaks and then how much was there of the peaks. So let me show you what comes out. So this is the chromatogram. Okay, so this is what was detected. At this time, so we call them retention times, it knows um, to draw these peaks to relative height of response from the electrode. So these different peaks came off at these specific times in these <coughs> relative amounts. And so the other part that you get with, so you will get two pages with your data. You'll get this page, the chromatogram, and then you'll also get this page that actually tells you each of those peaks and then how much of each peak there was there, okay? So the percent of the total. Um, from this, we're going to give you a list of retention times that tells you um, this compound comes off at this specific retention time. So use these retention times to figure out what the compounds are. Now, for all of the alcohols, we can't give you all the alkene possibilities. So the retention, the standard retention times list that we're going to give you, and it'll be specific to your lab section, will be for a certain set of retention times. But in those retention times, we'll show you what are the trends of cis and trans alkenes, and what are the trends in positional alkenes, where it's like, you know, two heptene, three heptene, four heptene, what are the retention times? So make sure you get that information from your professor because you'll need that for figuring out this data. Now what you want to show in your notebook is um, in the lab manual there's a table, table 10-2, and this is on page 10-11. You want to list the standard retention times, then the retention times from your um, chromatogram, give the area counts. And then, so the area counts, where it says um, peak area, um, give the area counts and then the area percentages, and all those percentages should add up to 100%, okay? And then you want to identify what each of those peaks are. Now, the peaks that you don't know what they are in the alkene region, you have to use the standards to help figure out what they are if you don't have a specific um, standard to tell you. So use the trends. So that's when I was telling you, if you have a, a trans alkene, you're going to have a cis alkene. 
even though you may not have the standard for the cis alkene. Okay, so be careful when you're looking at these standards to make sure you don't discount things just because of what the standard retention times are. You have to use what you know about the alkenes as well as the standards to put the pieces together. Now, one other piece that you will need to get in your lab notebook this week is when we show you the GC instruments, on the front of the GC, you will want to record um, how that GC, those GC samples were collected. So this is the conditions that we use for the GC. So how long is the column? What's the diameter? What's the stationary phase? Film thickness, um, injector and detector temperature. Then what is the program run on that column oven for initial time, initial temperature time, and then how that temperature is ramped over the process of the sample um, being run. Okay. So just make sure you get that in your lab manual. And if this, this is the same for both experiment 8 and experiment 11, the same condition, conditions. Are. Okay, so now I see, um, if you guys want to see, is Dr. Gilmore out there? Dr. Gilmore's out there. Yeah, Dr. Picard around. So we get Hying the Professor Part 2. So we get Dr. Picard and Dr. Gilmore. Get their new pies. I get this on camera. get priority on the names list for who gets the name pies. For the sake of collegiality in the department, I can't deliver Dr. Pickard's pie. So somebody has to give money besides me. I think I've got 92. Uh, 92 dollars, <laughs> folks. 92. Where are we up to? 92. Oh. We have it coming. All right. Oh, 97. Will you be sticking around? Hey. Hey. Oh. <laughs> 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 a hundred. A hundred dollars. You guys <laughs> bought a car. All right. So now everybody does have a pie, but we can we can always donate more pies. We have the whipped cream man technology. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so. Do we really want that $3 or something? Maybe we go to Wayne's. I really would like both of those 
God. It's only cost seven more dollars. Oh, look at that. That's a picture. That's a pie. All by itself, man. Excellent. But I'm going to go ahead and give a pie. So.